Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Today's weekend re-release is with Dave Eggers. We're nearing the end of our weekend re-release series, but how can you miss hearing about Dave Eggers from Dave Eggers? So cool. I hope you enjoy our chat together. Dave Eggers is the award-winning and best-selling author of many books, including The Circle, The Monk of Mocha, Her Right Foot, Lifters, and the heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius. He is founder of McSweeney's, an independent publishing company based in San Francisco that produces books, a humor website, and a journal of new writing, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern. Eggers is also the co-founder of 826 Valencia, a youth writing center which has inspired dozens of other centers worldwide. Today, we'll be talking about his new children's book, We Became Jaguars, which is amazing. So enjoy my conversation with this literary legend. Welcome, Dave. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Good to be here. I'm thrilled to talk to you about so much of the amazing work that you do to support other writers, younger writers, and just the amazing philanthropy that you're involved in. But also, we became Jaguars, your latest children's book, which is just amazing and also a perfect gift for Mother's Day with this whole grandmother, you know, (laughs) kneeling on the floor playing games with her grandchild. So so maybe we could just talk about this book first and how this book came to be. Well, you know, I don't know, even know if I have an origin story for this one. This one just sort of came out of the blue, which sometimes happens with picture books in particular. Sometimes it just starts with a phrase, which like in this case, it was the title. And I just wrote it down. I always start by writing things down on just sheets of copy paper, usually that I keep all over the house and by the bed. And and I just wrote down, we became Jaguars and woke up with that next to me by the bed with those words. And I, and then I went from there, what would it be like if, you know, a little boy and his grandmother pretended or actually became Jaguars? And I think, you know, I didn't have grandparents who were, you know, spry or with us uh, too long when I was a kid. But I do know that, you know, my kids have the benefit of, of, of having very active and engaged and incredible grandparents. And, and, you know, the adventures that they go on with them are completely apart from, you know, what we all, the rest of us do as a family. And I think that there's something really sacred and sometimes very mysterious even about those adventures with grandparents. And so this sort of takes that as its starting point. I love that. That's that's awesome. And also you had this edited by your editors in progress. Tell me a little bit more about the Young Editors Project as part of 826 National and all the other awesome things that you do. Well, you know, this is actually, this grew out of a little project that we call the Hawkins Project, which is sort of, it works with schools and teachers and young authors, and and we collaborate with different A26 centers around the country, and then centers that are like our, we started this center here in San Francisco, where I am right now. I'm across the street from 826 Valencia, which is a writing and tutoring center in the Mission District of San Francisco. And now there's like maybe 60 or 70 centers around the world that are kind of based on that model, where you have a whimsical theme. In our case, it's a pirate store. So the whole place looks like a pirate ship and a pirate store. And then it's sort of a mysterious front for a writing and tutoring center that supports younger writers as young as six. And so at one point, you know, I, I would read 
works in progress to kids for the last, you know, 10, 15 years. And then we sort of decided to make it a little bit more of a formal, well, not, it's not formal, but more of a expanded program that we call the Young Editors Project. And so a lot of other picture book writers like Sean Harris and Mac Barnett and Bethany Mergia and have, you know, they, they give manuscripts in progress that to us that we then send to teachers and classrooms around the country and around the world. And then the kids in the class will comment and say, oh, I really like this, or I wish there was more of that. The comments are always very generous and, you know, encouraging. They're very, they're very <laughs> forgiving and enthusiastic editors. And then every so often they'll say, you know, what about what about this? Have you ever thought about that? And sometimes these suggestions end up helping the authors with a ne- with the next draft or with the final draft. And I just like that. I, I don't know about you, but as a kid, you grow up assuming that all authors lived hundreds of years ago and that you'd never encounter one in the real world. But when I was a kid, I got to meet, well, sort of meet Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the poet laureate at the time. And she, you know, I grew up in Illinois. She was a well-known author from Chicago. And and to see that she was a living person who was also in our textbooks and everything, it meant a lot and kind of collapsed that space between being a young kid and then also thinking like, oh, there's actually authors in the world that are, you know, visible and reachable and engaged. And so this is a way where kids can see, feel part of the process and get in touch a little bit with authors that they might know. And then their names are always included in the book that they advised on. And so we're, you know, we're hoping to keep expanding the program and make it sort of a staple of a lot of picture books that each one of them might have 15, 20 names of young editors who, who help bring that book to fruition. Wow. That must just be the most amazing feeling for those kids to see their names in there. I saw the long list at the end and it's just the coolest. What it, how much you're changing their lives and their point of view. I feel like when I was younger, I, I had a pen pal relationship with one author. And the first time she wrote me back, I was like shocked. I was holding this piece of blue paper with her script handwriting on it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, a real writer wrote me back. I couldn't believe it. So Who was it? Her name was Zibby O'Neill, which I thought was amazing because I didn't know anybody else in the world. Yeah. Well, that was why you were attracted to her work a little bit, right? Or maybe why your parents got you her book. Yeah. It was. And anyway, she wrote a book called The Language of Goldfish, which I just loved. And then we kept in touch for all these years. And then eventually she took me to tea at the plaza and it was like the highlight (laughs) of my childhood. You know, I always think I'm sitting here at the McSweeney's offices and haven't been here that much since the pandemic. But, you know, I get mail here and I'm sitting here answering mail or I was this morning before talking to you. And that's my favorite thing in the world is just that personal connection. And if somebody writes to you and says that, you know, a book meant to meant something to them, I think people, I only get mail v- via paper mail. Like if you, if somebody, I love that process. I don't have a public email address because I, I'm just not good at email, <laughs> but I love writing letters and getting letters in the mail. And I remember that too. I wrote, I used to write to the Lego company my friend Dan Carter and I were Lego obsessed, and we would once a month write letters to the Lego company in Enfield, Connecticut, with ideas about how they, you know, what they could do next. And we always had ideas for Lego sets. And there was a woman there that wrote back to us every time. She was in the public relations department, I'm sure. But she had beautiful stationery and beautiful envelopes in it. And she'd always put little extra things in there, like, I don't know, information about upcoming Lego things. And to have that connection, or to have a human on the other end of something that you admired so much, actually take the time to recognize you as a human, right? And say, you know, I got your letter. I read it. Here's my, it just was, I kept all of them. I still have them all. I think there's like 12 letters that we got and I have them in a scrapbook and it meant the world. And so I think having that sort of, lifeline or having that connection. I think it means a lot to the authors too, to have somebody on the other end of what you do, because 
unlike a musician that's you know playing a concert or where you're hearing from people immediately very often writing is kind of solitary and you're not there the moment that somebody listens to you know read your work you're not sitting over their shoulder and you get the benefit of them you know responding in real time and so that those letters mean a lot and sometimes we authors are just as eager for that connection as are the readers. So I'm glad that you reached out to your fellow Zibby. <laughs> and I always tell everybody to, to write letters because you won't always get an answer. Sometimes somebody's in a stage of life where they can't answer. And I've been there years ago where I just fell behind with mail and I couldn't get back to people. But, but chances are that person will write you back and that connection is complete. And that's what keeps us going in some cases. I think you should take those 12 Lego letters and make those into a, another children's book. Yeah, I wish uh, they're in deep storage now. I don't I I wonder what they said. A little bit of it was like a little formal, like, well, we can't accept your ideas, Dave and Dan, because <laughs> we have our own Lego creators. But and then we would turn around and send them another idea the next month, you know, like we would not get the message, yep. <laughs> but you know, uh, so I don't know if they would be, they okay, don't necessarily they be... have a compelling narrative so much, but they, <laughs> they personalized to us. And she eventually would say, good to hear from you again, Dan and Dave, <laughs> as I said before, but you know, she was very kind. I wish I could remember her name off the top of my head, but I do still have them somewhere. All right. I will, I will let you just keep coming up with your own book ideas then. Yeah. I'll just leave that. Well, you're <laughs> welcome. I'll keep, send, <laughs> I'll keep listening and take that into consideration, Zibby. Thank you very much. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. Speaking of coming up with ideas, you have written so many books and children, like so many things. You just, and you've started McSweeney's to help, and other people have written things and you have ideas all the time. And yes, your scraps of paper and, and what you said earlier is part of the process, but what else helps you come up with the ideas and, and decide which ones are worth your time pursuing? Well, I'll stick with picture books for, for now. You know, what's funny is it is a process where and I know that a lot of your listeners probably have picture books in mind. And a good friend of mine, I went to high school with a writer named Amy Krauss Rosenthal, who passed mm -hmm. away a few years ago. But we went to high school together, and then I think her kids were teenagers. And we used to publish her at an old magazine called Might Magazine. So I've been a fan of her work forever since we were in our 20s together. And then a little later on, she started writing picture books. And she was just so gifted at it, and she's written so many classics, and they have, you know, obviously reached a, a really wide audience. Still, I remember picking her brain about it because I was, after she had published a number of books, and I was always wanted to write picture books. And I, you know, I, when she was out in San Francisco one time, I we took a long walk, and I was like, so how do you do this, and who do you reach out to, and what, it, you know, and she really clarified that a lot of it is like that alchemy between your idea, how it comes together on the page, how it, an agent might respond to it, and then how a publisher and an editor at that publisher responds to it. And anyone that's aspiring to write a book has to realize that it's a very human process every step of the way. And I've written picture books that no editors responded to. And that's because it's a very particular alchemy. I might think it's, you know, really good idea, but then the editor has her particular taste and things that, you know, my editors are all women. And so I'm just thinking of Taylor Norman, who edits my books at Chronicle and Andrea Cooper, who's at Little Brown. And, you know, they, I might send them something and they say, oh, this is for me or this isn't for me or this still needs work or they'll gently somehow <laughs> indicate it doesn't have merit. And I think that as long as you realize that it really is a personal and idiosyncratic process that you have to perfectly match up, you know, that idea with the execution with the editor 
And when it all comes together, something really nice can happen. And in this case, Taylor Norman, my editor at Chronicle, really liked We Became Jaguars. And then she helps improve it and shape it. And then we find an, an artist, in this case, you know, Woodrow White, who had not illustrated a picture book before. He was just a, a fine artist that I loved his work when I'd seen it online. And we asked him if he'd ever considered doing it. And he took it on and then just made this gorgeous bunch of illustrations. And I think I always just want to, because I've been on the publishing side for so long, I always want to tell people that you have to be really patient. You have to be very flexible and you really have to be very understanding that the people that are on the other end, on the publishing side, on the agent side, they're all humans and they're all really busy. They're all trying to put out books and it's not like a Kinko service. You know, you send in your <laughs> manuscript and you get a book back in two days, you know, and they should know or immediately respond to whatever you think is a finished product. I think it's much more idiosyncratic and much more personal than people often imagine. Does that make sense? Of course. Yeah. I think the acceptance of different projects obviously is personal and has so many factors. Whereas if you're the person writing it, all you're thinking about is your creation, right? You're not, you don't realize that the person might have 70 different picture books sitting in front of them and they've already committed to these and, you know, they have to rush home for this. And, you know, yes, of course. I think it, they, it's so much in life. You don't realize what's going on on the other end <laughs> of, of your hopes and dreams. Yeah. I, I feel like more so than in a lot of fields, I don't know if the submitter always understands that the person on the other side is almost in the exact same spot. They're sitting at home, you know, they've got a lot of tall stack of manuscripts. They can only publish probably eight books a year, 12 or whatever. And they've got a thousand options, you know, to do it. And so I, when the, in the picture book realm, because they don't, you know, it's, I don't know, I have, I have far more ideas than ever get to print. And it's up to the editors to sort of help sort out and find the best ones and save me from my bad <laughs> ideas, I think, which is a personal, uh, I have a lot of gratitude toward them for gently helping sift through and find the ones that are worthy. Well, I feel like it makes, it will make other people feel better to know that even your ideas get passed on occasionally <laughs> and that it, perhaps it's not just them being rejected. More than occasionally, I'd say two thirds of the picture book notions I have are, are passed on for sure. And then there's the ones that Sometimes you're just looking for somebody to, I, I, you know, you might take it 80% of the way and you say, what do you think of this so far? And if there's polite silence, <laughs> then you know that maybe you could direct your energy somewhere else. And so to me, to finish something, I usually need somebody's enthusiasm a little bit. And so those last, you know, bunch of drafts are, it becomes more fun and more easy to do it when you have somebody on the receiving end who's, who's ready for it and has already expressed you know, some kind of affection for it and can urge you over the finish line, I guess. I actually have a picture book coming out from Penguin Random House next year. I'm very excited. It's called Princess Charming. Oh, good. Yeah, Congratulations. Thanks. Isn't it a fun process, especially when the illustrator starts sending you art Yes, back, it's the coolest. You can only compare it to sort of Christmas morning or your birthday or whatever holiday is meaningful to you because it's just when you open that email and you see, you know, some new creation based on your words. It's just indescribable, don't you think? Yeah. Have they already started illustrating yours? They have. And I got like two of the character drawings and I was so excited. I printed them out and I gave copies to, I have four kids. So I like printed them out, one for each kid and everybody was running around holding the copies. Uh, that's so great. Yeah, really How old are your kids? Six, seven, and then I have twins that are almost 14. They're, they're 13. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What fun for them, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I always included, you know, I always picked my kids' brains and had them read early drafts. You know, they're such a supportive audience, you know, like they, maybe my kids were just polite, but, you know, they were always like, yeah, you know, I mean, 
And that's one of the things we used to have kids at 826 Valencia review movies for the San Francisco Chronicle, because I always thought kids should review kids' movies. I just don't know if there's any point in adults reviewing kids' movies. (laughs) It's just a total disconnect. (laughs) And these kids would come in after school here to get, you know, to do writing and tutoring. And then they, we would send them to screenings of movies that they would get to see with their families for free. And there were, and then the Chronicle would run five, six of these reviews together and they were all uniformly glowing, you know, <laughs> because they'd seen the movie for free with their family. They get to see it before other people. And, and generally speaking, kids are just so full of wonder and awe and enthusiasm for everything that they are sort of, in a way, the best audience because they're like, whatever movie that we think isn't the best kids movie ever, they think is the best movie that was ever made, Mm -hmm. which is always the last movie they saw was pretty much the best movie ever made. And so I think there's something about their unbridled and unsullied enthusiasm that I think authors should avail themselves of. And if you're not sure about something, showing it to kids, I think will give you that shot in the arm. I don't know if you find that to be the same thing with yours. I think focus groups are always a good idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially focus groups at home where they count on you for food and shelter. So there's like an exchange there that they know that if they don't support mom's book, maybe they don't eat. Yeah. I should really tie it, just a joke. tie it to the allocation of, of Robux, which is sort of, you know, sweeping the family at the moment. <laughs> Robux? What are Robux? Oh my gosh. So Roblox is this online video game thing where in the, it, it's almost like a, it has a ton of games under the banner of Roblox and you can pick which ones you want and you have your own person who's your character. And it's essentially like virtual reality of sorts. Like you're walking through and you've got to, and you can see your friends who are also, so if my two kids are on two iPads, they meet up in the game with their little personas. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah actually, this is sounding familiar. The company actually just went public last week and I was like looking at the newspaper and there was this full page ad about like, congratulations on Roblox going public. And I was like, you're kidding. Like my whole life yeah. is Roblox. So anyway, but yeah, this is why my kids don't read enough clearly, but anyway. Well, it's a weird time. I think, I hope when the pandemic's over, we can sort of get back to a little bit more of a balance where they don't, they're not required to be on screens as much as they are right now. Yeah, that would be nice. But it's the way, it's the only way, obviously right now, and teachers have done an incredible job of, you know, re- engineering everything to work through screens. But I do feel like it's out of balance for sure. The kids are sort of on, you know, required to to sit in one place and be on screens for so much of the day. And I hope that when it's over, we can recalibrate and make sure that they have enough quiet time away from screens to be able to find that sort of peace of mind that you need to be able to sit quietly with a book. And I, you know, I, I grew up in a house where we had the TV on probably 16 hours a day. And so I, it does alter the mind, especially Mm -hmm. a growing mind. And so I was only able to read if I was really isolated for a while. Mm. And, and because I think my brain had been, you know, sort of, you know, engineered to expect more diversion and more noise and more distraction and things going on. But to really read. And I, you know, I'll say this to any parents out there, like for me, the first time I was able to sort of just read on my own was my freshman year in high school. Not the first time. I certainly read everything that we had to read in school. Anything they told me to read, I read, but on my own, really for fun, we had a class in freshman year. It was like a class that was supposed to be for counseling, I guess. And if you weren't seeing your counselor that period, you just were sent to this little quiet room that was full of books and you had to sit on a pillow and read for that hour. So I pulled Frank Herbert's Dune off of the shelf. I'd never heard of it or anything about it, but, and then I read and, and it it was because we had that isolated space, total, no noise and nothing else to do, no other options, but to read. That's what got me finally in that space where I could you know, really read a, an adult novel for, for fun. And, 
And it's just to say for those of you out there, parents who, you know, have especially kids that are reluctant readers or have, or are a little squirmy, have a hard time sitting still, just realize it takes quite a lot of isolation and downtime and quiet to really get in that place where where that kid can shut everything else out and really get absorbed in a book. But so it's not, if you think that you can say, read for 20 minutes, here's a book. <laughs> it's not that easy for a lot of kids. Sometimes those conditions really, you really have to create an environment that allows it for a kid that's, whose brain is on fire, you know, and who's so given to distraction. So that's my little bit of it, what I've learned. Well, thank you for making me feel better and not feeling like the worst <laughs> mom on the planet, which I feel like half the time. So, well, you know, I hope that you don't. I hope that you're not serious. I no, I'm I not. I'm, not like, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we can never judge ourselves when we're doing everything we can, especially right now. I feel like yes, it's been such a weird time, and we're never gonna. It will be a decade before we realize how weird it's been for the kids. But when they start writing about it in their college creative writing papers and things like that. But I do feel like parents, you know, modeling that behavior, having a reading hour or reading 90 minutes at home or reading out loud. Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm a big reading out loud as a family person, but I do. We've done it some and it's always magical Mm -hmm. if you can spare that time. And then I always, when I do I read, I meet people at like bookstores, you know, bookstore signings and stuff and I'll meet some 22-year-old guy with his mom, and they, they read out loud together, even at 22. And I'm always thinking that these are like the greatest humans imaginable that have that time to sort of, you know, just read aloud to each other, because it really does penetrate the psyche in a whole new way. If you're in a room with somebody you know, and you're reading out loud, just like when you I remember every word that my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bringleson, read when she read Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach. Mm -hmm. I can picture exactly where I sat, who was sitting next to me, the feel of the carpet, the light from the window, everything about it. And that book, I feel like I could recite because of how she read it to us. You know, oh, so that's a nice image. I love that. Yeah, I read, I do read every night out loud to my kids. And I actually read to my husband <laughs> when I have like a book. Oh, good. Yeah, when I have a book that I think he would love because I read all the time, you know, for my podcast yeah. and all this. Anyway, so if it's a book I think he'll love, I'm like, well, let me read it to you. So then I read it out loud to him. And that's really fun. Wow. And how long will you will you read just passages or a whole chapter or what? I'll read like a, a couple book. chapters before bed or if yeah. we're in a long car ride and we don't happen to have the kids or they're all on their iPads or something and it's a great book, I'll I'll read it. And, you know, he likes it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll give a plug for the best book on tape because we drive from California to Idaho fairly often. And the best book, so we'll listen to books on tape. And the best one I ever heard was Sissy Spacek doing To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. And, you know, there, there's there been some extraordinary books on tape. And the guy who does most of my books on tape, Dion Graham, is a great, you know, he's an actor and he's on movies and TV. And he also does books on tape and he's uh, extraordinary at it. But it's such an underappreciated art. And for all ages, that Sissy Spacek to Kill a Mockingbird is something that she took a classic and somehow made it even better. Hmm. And she just threw everything she has at that and really sounds like Scout. You know, if you could imagine what Scout's voice would have been like as an adult, it's her. And um, so I can't recommend that highly enough. Maybe. Okay. When I need a break. (laughs) When I need a break, I'll... uh... (laughs) Um, exactly. I know I've already taken so much of your time. Can I just ask one last question, which is what advice would you have for aspiring authors? You know, I would get yourself in a writing group before almost anything else, because you need peer editing. You need people to bounce ideas off and say, how is this reading? And I'm a pretty obsessive editor and, and a seeker of editing. And I feel like the one mistake some people make is not showing your work to anybody until you send it to a publisher, which I think is like skipping a hundred steps in between. I always compare it to deciding that you're going to 
be a professional football player and just showing up at the stadium one day <laughs> dressed up. It's like, so wait, you missed high school football, college football, the draft, the tra- you know, combat, you, you skip every step in between. Now you're just going to show up at the stadium. It seems in the publishing world, it can work every one in a thousand times, but otherwise going through those normal steps of, you know, rigorously improving your work and being willing to edit and take feedback and um, holding yourself to the highest standard and having the community of fellow writers that are going to help you and support you and encourage you and helping them. And then when 10 people you know all say, okay, this is perfect, it's ready to go, then that's time to send your work out. But I feel like it's always a little, people are so, I think you get so excited and so impatient that you start sending your work out when you've done one draft. And then that disappointment can be crushing. And then a lot of it is that you've, you haven't prepared. Mm-hmm. You've, you've, you run to the stadium half dressed, you know? And so I think <laughs> being patient and then going back to what I was saying before is that the person on the other end of your submission is overworked, underpaid, has a 12 foot stack of manuscripts. They're desperately trying to get through and they're doing the best they can. So, and if you don't find that publisher, publish it yourself. This has never been easier in the history of humankind to put a book out into the world and find an audience. It's, we're very lucky to be living in this time in that way and that you can put it online, you can find a printer. All of these things are democratically available for the first time ever. And so if you don't find that agent publisher connection, then do it yourself and, uh, and somebody will find it. It'll mean something to somebody. So you should be patient, but don't wait forever. Love it. Well, Dave, thank you so much. This has been so enjoyable for me. And I hope that I meet you in person. And I'm so glad I've gotten to know you and and your wife, Ben Slavita, about her book, Um, We Run the Tides. And it's just been great. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Zibi. Great to meet you. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 